the vibrant cosmopolitan city of Berlin attracts LGBTQI people from around the world, including trans people. The transgender community has become increasingly visible in recent years. Trans people have always existed, around the globe, in every culture. Berlin has played a key role in trans history for more than a century now. People come to the city from around the world so they can lead lives unconstrained by gender roles or conservative sexual norms. According to the city authorities, Berlin is home to between two and 300,000 queer people an estimated 8% of the population. It's not clear how many of them identify as trans or intersex. Many places cater for the LGBTQI community. Berlin's queer magazine, Ziegazoyla, has collated a map of relevant venues on its online portal, ziegazoyla.de. Advice centers, specialist doctors, hundreds of party locations and cafes, as well as cultural resources, such as museums and bookshops. We're taking you on a four-chapter journey through Berlin's queer past and present, one that explores... One, why trans asterisk people from around the globe come to Berlin today. Two, how a scientific pioneer challenged prevailing sexual norms more than a century ago. Three, how Berlin achieved cult status for its queer scene in the 1970s. And four, what life is like for trans people in Berlin today and what problems they encounter. But what does being trans mean? Well, first off, trans people are part of the queer community. Queer is a collective term for people whose gender identity and or sexual orientation does not correspond to the heterosexual norm. Trans asterisk is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Within there is a huge range. There are some people who identify themselves as trans man or trans woman, and then we call this, they fit into gender binary. And some people don't identify with male or female gender, and they define themselves, for example, as non-binary. Chapter one, so why do trans asterisk people from all around the globe flock to Berlin? We ask two young members of the trans community who have moved to the German capital. Felicia Roletschka, a tour guide in Berlin's Gay Museum, which focuses on LGBTQI themes and culture and Holden Madagame, an opera singer from the U.S. who has put down roots in Berlin. My name is Holden Madagame, and I moved to Germany in 2013 because Germany has about a third of the world's opera, and I'm transgender. I felt comfortable sort of realizing myself as a trans person in Berlin. Hi, my name is Felicia, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a transgender activist and tour guide in Berlin. I came out in 2016, so six years ago, and coming out was a very mixed experience, I had very positive experiences here in Berlin, in the communities and spaces I was moving in, the area I was studying and the friends I had, the social circles I had, most of that was very positive. Felicia began transitioning in 2015 at the age of 20. She came to Berlin because she wanted to live in a city where she could come out as trans. Holden came to Berlin from the United States for work, but it wasn't just a career move. There were also some highly personal reasons for the relocation. I think what attracts trans and queer people internationally uh, to come to Berlin is Partially that there's a big community here already and everybody sort of knows that Berlin is like the trans queer city, like it has that international reputation for it already. And I think also because I don't want to call it a utopia, but it, it, cause it's not necessarily a utopia, but it's like Berlin is a really great place to be trans and queer. It feels really, really safe. And I think a lot of the world is not safe. And so I think a lot of trans people come here because they know basically that they're going to be safe. 
Um, and if they come from really um, oppressive uh, countries or oppressive places, um, it's going to be so much better here. I think that's a major part of it. There are huge opportunities for trans people here. There is a chance for community just in places like this, as we are right now, or in other community spaces all across the city. Things trans people in the rest of Germany often don't have or don't have to that degree, which is the reason why many trans people move to Berlin in order to live their life. Berlin first became a queer haven over a century ago. That long history has helped give today's city its colorful and inclusive reputation. But the terms we use now to describe queer people are comparatively new. The term transgender didn't really come into existence until the middle of the 20th century. This is not to say that people weren't experiencing discomfort in their assigned gender or dysphoria or feeling a, a desire to express gender more broadly or more or differently than, than society um, would have wanted or expected. Chapter 2. How a pioneer challenged sexual norms more than 100 years ago. Berlin became internationally famous in the early 20th century for its hedonistic, decadent nightlife. But it was also where the first groundbreaking research on sexuality and gender identity was conducted, and the first sex reassignment surgery. Magnus Hirschfeld was the driving force. He was a pioneer of sexology and one of the first people to scientifically investigate sexual and gender identities. In 1919, he set up the Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin. He coined the now outdated term transvestite for people who describe themselves as trans asterisk today. He actually researched um, the entire spectrum of uh, gender identity and sexuality. He assisted people in his practice as a doctor to um, to come to terms, he gave people a vocabulary about what they were experiencing and he offered actual um, assistance in the case of, for example, of trans men and women. He helped them with, with early um, gender confirmation surgery, with hormone therapy, with plastic surgery, with practical measures like uh, hair removal. So he really did make a difference in a lot of people's lives. James Conway is the translator of Berlin's Third Sex. Written by Magnus Hirschfeld, it was published at the start of the 20th century and was one of the first works about Berlin's queer subculture. Hirschfeld was himself part of this community and wrote about venues like the queer nightclub and cabaret El Dorado. It was later targeted by the Nazis. Before that, Berlin was a place of freedom and experimentation. In the Weimar era, you have Lily Elba, who is known to us through the, um, the book and the film The Danish Girl. The movie The Danish Girl from the year 2015 retells the story of Lily Elbe. The Danish trans person and artist was a media sensation. She was one of the first intersex people to undergo gender reassignment surgery in 1930. She came to Germany for the procedure. Lily Elba came from Denmark and consulted with uh, Magnus Hirschfeld and he guided her through gender confirmation surgery. Magnus Hirschfeld wasn't just a doctor and a scientist. He was an activist campaigning for the rights of queer people. This campaign included a revolutionary regulation in Berlin from the year 1909, co-drafted by Hirschfeld. It granted trans people the right to dress as they pleased in public and in the workplace. They no longer needed to fear arrest for public order offenses. Hirschfeld had with the police president a deal ausgehandelt. Hirschfeld negotiated a deal with the police chief, which looked like this. Hirschfeld would issue a medical certificate and a diagnosis which read transvestite. With this diagnosis, the trans person would go to the police headquarters and get a photo ID stating that they are transvestite. 
The document will be stamped by the police chief. If this trans person were walking down the street and the police stopped them, they could show their transvestite ID and the police would refrain from arresting and charging them. In other words, this was a way of evading legal persecution, and that was an important milestone set in 1909 on Hirschfeld's initiative. Sozusagen gesetzt wurde auf Hirschfelds Initiative. Hirschfeld was ahead of his time, but not everyone agreed with his ambitious reforms. As far as the Nazis were concerned, he embodied everything they despised about the un-German Weimar Republic. When they seized power in 1933, the Nazis ransacked the research library at Hirschfeld's Institute. It was one of the first targets of the Nazi book burning program. At this book burning, the bust of Magnus Hirschfeld was carried over the heads of the Nazis as they marched toward the bonfire. Seizing these trophies from the Institute was a way of showing that the spirit of the Weimar era must be extinguished by symbolically casting the bust and the entire contents of the library into the flames. It was almost a pagan ritual to cleanse Germany of quote-unquote unclean tendencies. Magnus Hirschfeld was on an international lecture tour when the Nazis came to power and laid his institute to waste. He never went back to Germany. After all, he knew that as a gay Jewish social democrat he would never be safe in the Third Reich. Magnus Hirschfeld died a broken man. He died on his birthday. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but he died having seen his life's work literally going up in flames. Hirschfeld's reformist influence was lost during the Nazi dictatorship. Berlin's free spirit disappeared for decades, and with it, the freedoms that queer people had fought so hard to gain. But then came the 1960s and 70s. Chapter 3, How Berlin Became a Cult Location for the Queer Community in the 70s. When Berlin was still divided by a wall, there were places in both parts of the city where transgender and queer people could gather and express themselves, albeit in different ways. West Berlin really was a safe haven back then, that's true. You could live here without being bothered. We didn't really have any rights, but we could get everything we needed. There was a trans community, which meant we could communicate with each other. There were already basic networks in place, which is important because you need information, and that existed in West Berlin. The trans community was small, but it existed, and you didn't have to feel that you were just on your own. Nora Eckert has written a book about her life story. When I came to West Berlin in 1973, it was the first place I had ever heard of trans people. I learned there were people who were trans, and that was very important for me because I saw that it was possible that these people actually did exist. There was a nightly drag show, which was also something really special. But for me, it was also an opportunity to go and see trans people. Not everyone on stage was trans. There were also gay men who had made a career of performing in drag. But there were also trans women performing, and seeing them was very, very special for me, because I was able to see that it was possible to live that way. The best-known trans performer at the time was Romy Hogg, whose parties were one of the reasons why disreputable West Berlin became a hotspot for misfits and the art community. The Dutch national arrived in Berlin in the 1970s. Before that, she'd been a dancer at the famous Paris nightclub Alcazar. She was an absolute idol, of course. She looked amazing, and that alone made her a role model. In 1974, Romy Haag opened her Travesty Club, Chez Romy Haag, in West Berlin. 
it quickly became a popular venue with those seeking a more open, inclusive nightlife experience. This was when Romy Hogg started dating David Bowie. The singer liked to play with gender roles and adopted an androgynous look. In Rebel Rebel, he sings about a mother who's annoyed by her child's confusion. At the same time, dancer Marlo La Fantastique was lured by Berlin's free spirit and arrived from the United States. She loved the city so much she ended up staying for 30 years. She also worked with Romy Hogg for a time. Well, she was a, a star coming from Paris, and she was already established with her name. And she came to Chez New, and we worked, I think, a whole six months. She was a quiet, enjoyable person. Before Shea Romy Hogg, there was the Shea Nu, Berlin's oldest queer cabaret or travesty theater, as they are called. Famed throughout Europe, it opened in 1958 and closed in 2008. I had a contract, exclusive contract, to work in cabaret Shea Nu by the original owner and founder of the cabaret. And I left from New York going to Berlin. After my contract with Shenu, which was a year, then I ended up staying and working in other clubs and cabarets and theaters. My Lord. Cabaret and especially cross-dressing were in vogue at the time. Marlo felt more comfortable and accepted as a trans woman and performer in Germany than in the United States. Now here in America, it was different. It was just a different type of politics. And the girls were discriminated against very badly. But Berlin was just different. And I, I liked it. And Germany was very exciting. And, and, and uh, they were a very broad-minded, fantastic people. And they loved Travis <laughs> The nightclubs and cabarets shaped West Berlin's image around the world. In East Berlin, there was also a small, connected queer scene. In communist East Germany, Nadia Schallenberg lived openly as a trans person and was an activist in the queer community groups. One of her main meeting places was the Sonntags Club, which still exists today. Berlin was always a melting pot for all kinds of people in East Germany, for intellectuals, homosexuals, artists and misfits. There wasn't much information in the 80s, neither in West Germany nor in the East. And what you did see in the media was almost always presented in a very negative light, a man in women's clothing. That was something out of the movies. In East Berlin, Charlotte von Malsdorf was a pioneer in the trans community. She began collecting everyday objects in the 1950s and exhibiting them in the Gutshaus Malsdorf. The manor house became a Wilhelminian era museum and a famous meeting place for East Berlin's queer community. After coming out, I met Charlotte, and that's how I found the community. Lottchen was already well known in the East German scene, but after German reunification, people's awareness about her grew a lot. Charlotte von Malsdorf received the Federal Order of Merit, Germany's highest order in 1992. She passed away in 2002. She too paved the way for today's more tolerant Berlin. At the Gay Museum in Berlin, an exhibition is dedicated to the efforts of trans activists like Charlotte von Malsdorf and Nadia Schallenberg. Chapter 4. How do trans people live in Berlin today and what problems do they face? 
There are many spaces in Berlin that can act as safe harbors for trans people, but not universally as a city as a whole. This huge dimension of hate crimes and violence and discrimination that we experience in the streets, in our workplaces and in our social environments. It's difficult to gauge the exact extent of violence against queer people. Until recently, only a fraction of anti-LGBTQI crime was recorded by the authorities. In 2020, however, Berlin became the first German state to publish an annual report monitoring the homophobic and transphobic violence. In 2021, the Victim Support Center Maneo registered a spike in reports. Despite an estimated 80 to 90 percent of incidents going unreported, the center recorded 731 cases of insults, threats and attacks against transgender people, gays and lesbians. In this in-between phase where like they can't tell if you're a woman or a man, people get really angry. They just get angry that they, they can't figure it out, you know, and so you know, people would spit at you. I had like, um, like boys who would like squirt water at me with squirt guns or something like that. You know, like that stuff like that happens all the time. One time I was walking home late at night and um, a boy was riding his bicycle and he was just like harassing me. And um, it was really scary. It was really late at night and there wasn't anybody around. And it is not only the fear of hate crime that weighs heavily on members of the trans community. Those who hope for fast and uncomplicated medical treatment in Berlin may also be disappointed. And if we're talking about Germany specifically, then um, there, are the, there is the issue of massive barriers for trans people when they are entering the medical system looking for gender affirming treatments. Some of these barriers may include extensive waiting periods before access to um, hormone replacement therapies or any kind of other medical procedures. There are long waiting periods with discriminating and humiliating processes that are part of that. Despite many obstacles, trans people are becoming more visible in society. In 2021, voters elected the first two trans women to the German parliament, the Bundestag. Internationally, the spotlight is on Hollywood stars like Elliot Page or Michaela J. Rodriguez, who raise awareness about diversity. There were many decades of, of activism and resistance and risk-taking by many people, particularly by people who could not um, who could not hide who they were, and who can't hide who they are. Oftentimes it's people who don't fit into the categories uh, and who can't, who don't have the option of hiding, right? It's, it's people who, um, who are trans and present as trans. I think the history of like the queer community in Berlin is still important till today because like um, our chosen family, our ancestors did a lot of work like also under very harsh condition and I think like it's their work and their passion which allows us today to have the spaces, to have the knowledge and to have the idea of what it could mean being trans, being queer. And I'm very thankful. And I think like it's one of the important part of being queer to honor the people, yeah, who have worked for it, who have died for it, who have suffered for it. And I think it's important to acknowledge that every single time you're being out and queer. Although the struggle for more tolerance and diversity continues, the city's past offers some hope. I think as a trans person in Berlin, but I think I, I see it becoming more of a sort of interconnected, caring system. So I see things like that getting even better in Berlin. Berlin is definitely home and I, I would like it to stay as my home. Ja, eine Handlung, klar wie der Tag, da weiß man, woran man ist, das ist unser Fall, sagt man sich. I expect that as an artist, as like a singer, I will probably move a couple of times for jobs, but Berlin will always be home. Berlin, the rainbow capital. It might not be a trans person's paradise yet, but the city remains a refuge for queer people seeking an open community just as it has been for over a century. What is your experience with queer or trans life in your country? Let us know in the comments. 